All right, I think we're live now. Hey, welcome back to our study on the sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testament. Anybody have to remember what we talked about last week? I kind of mentioned it just a minute ago. Uh, Brother Adam? Peace yeah, the peace offering. What? How is to be sacrificed? If you're paying attention, we'll see some similarities again this week. This week, we're going to look at the sin offering. Now, uh, sin offering does kind of carry over a little bit in chapter 5, but this chapter is long enough. We'll look at th those verses next week. But anyone happen to know the first mention of a sin offering in the scriptures? And not, certainly, Genesis chapter 4 was the first. Chapter 3, excuse me, was the first sacrifice for sin, but the actual first time sin offering is mentioned besides Adam. Well, that was really a burnt offering that he offered there. But it's going to be in Exodus chapter 29. We'll go over there here in a second. Uh, I did, for those who are interested in word studies, uh, the Hebrew... In the Hebrew, there's a general word for offerings, which is korban. Perhaps you all remember that from Adam's class. Mark chapter 7, verse 11 uses that word directly. It means offering or a gift. But each of these offerings have their own word in Hebrew as well. You know, the burnt offering has its own word, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. It's not like us in the English where we have offering and then a descriptive word added to it. I thought it was interesting though that for sin offering it's the same word that's translated as the noun version of sin. So every time you see the Old Testament you see you know, someone's sin, it's the same word in Hebrew. Just an interesting side note for us. The first time you find this word translated as sin offering in Really, the first time the phrase appears at all in scriptures, sin offering, is in Exodus 29, 14. We'll go on over there. Let's go ahead and read the, uh, starting in verse 10 of Exodus 29. Here, if you remember from, I think it was last week, or so they were consecrating the tabernacle. And here it's, says, Now shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the innards and the caul that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung thou shalt burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Now, we won't get too much in the, the details of this because this is the sin offering for the priest as we'll see in our text in Leviticus 4. There was a sin offering for the priest, the whole congregation of Israel, for rulers, and for the common people. But notice verse 14, and we see our phrase that I asked you all to look up without the camp. Anybody happen to do their homework and find out what that meant as far as dictionary-wise and, I guess, the significance of it? Well, Larry? Dictionary-wise, it just means away from the camp, on the perimeter. Yeah, outside of the camp, if you could say. That's how we would probably say it today. Outside of Israel. Yeah, it was out. It was the camp of Israel that they were to go outside of. And would it, was it a type of discipline or what we would call discipline like from the church? Well, really, well, that is part of the way they used it in the Old Testament. Yeah, they had to get the sin out of the yeah. camp. In the New Testament, the phrase without the gate is used to describe the sacrifice of Christ. I mean, it's you know, sin always had to be dealt with outside of the camp. Um, Leviticus 24, verse 
13 through 14 tells us that they were to stone that person without the camp. Uh, there's a number of scriptures we can turn to. I want to look at Numbers chapter 5, though. Numbers chapter 5, the first three verses. Here it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and every one that hath an issue, and whosoever is defiled by the dead, both male and female shall ye put out. Without the camp shall ye put them out, that they defile not their camps in the midst whereof I dwell. See, the lepers, all that was unclean, all that was sinful, had to be put outside the camp. Because God himself says he dwelt in the midst thereof. Uh, Deuteronomy twenty three fourteen tells us a similar thing, but we can read that. Deuteronomy twenty three fourteen. He says, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that, the, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Because God dwelt with them in the camp, they had to take sin outside of the camp. Right. As we'll see when we get over to Hebrews, Christ was outside the gate, or outside of Jerusalem, if you will. No, they didn't have a... It was a, it was a type of a, their sins being removed from them. Uh, numbers chapter 15 we won't go there 35 and 36 uh, numbers 31 16 through 20 also tell us how that sin had to be dealt with outside the camp you know, they, always, they took people outside the camp to stone them mm -hmm. lepers were to dwell outside the camp so without the camp is, signifies dealing with sin if you will having it removed from your presence and really from the presence of God since he dwelt in the camp. But we'll go on over to our our text now. Leviticus chapter 4, beginning verse 1. Leviticus 4 and verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do any or do against any of them if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people then let him bring for his sin which he has sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering and he shall <coughs> excuse me and he shall bring the bullock under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord so here we see in verse 2 this was an offering for sins done through ignorance you know that's not done knowingly or purposefully we often sin through ignorance don't we right. you know sometimes we certainly the law of God is written on our hearts but sometimes we don't fully understand the things of God what we are to do notice it does say that if he shall sin any against the commandment of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done so this was for particularly for sins of commission versus sins of omission you know I think we're familiar with thou shalt not steal thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill and so on and so forth that's the things he is speaking of here you know, honor thy father and thy mother if we don't do that then that is a sin of omission but here he says, if we do any of the things which we should not be done through ignorance, this is the offering for it. And verse 3 tells us that this is for the priest. You know, so even the priests were prone to sin, and their sin had to be dealt with first before they could deal with the sins of the people. But we see it was to be a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Once again, we see this without blemish again it had to be perfect if you will it couldn't be a lame or sick or anything like that it couldn't have defects in it 
But a young bullock was to be brought before the Lord. And of course we see again here in verse 4 that they were to lay their hand upon it, you know, identifying it with them, in a sense laying their sin upon it, as our sin was laid upon Christ. Right. We'll go on to the next three verses here. Uh, verse 5 says, And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. We see here they were to bring the blood in they were to dip their fingers in it. It says sprinkle seven times, which always represents perfection or completion in the scriptures. Right. That it will be a perfect atonement, if you will. And it says it was done before the veil. That's inside the tabernacle, but outside the Holy of Holies. And it was on the altar of incense they were to put this, which was a golden altar. It was inside the tabernacle. They put the blood upon the horns of the t that altar. As we'll see later, that wasn't the case in every offering here. And then they poured the rest of it, it says, upon, shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is the brazen altar, which is outside. And they poured the rest of it there. And it was all to be burnt up. All the blood was offered to God here. You know, they, as we mentioned last week, none of it was to be consumed. None of it was to be wasted, right. as Christ's blood was not wasted. Uh, let's go on to the next verse here. Look at verses 8 through 12, and it says, And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, and the fat that covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, which is or with the kidneys, it shall he take away. As it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of, burnt, of the burnt offering, and the skin of the bullock and all his flesh, with his head and with his legs and his innards and his dung, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place, where the ashes are poured out, and burn him on the wood with fire, where the ashes are poured out, shall he be burnt. So just as the peace offering was, they were to take all the fat anything that contained fat, and they were to burn it on the altar of burnt offering, which is the brazen altar. I think someone mentioned last week about how big it was. I looked it up, and it's about seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, about four and a half feet tall. But the, like I said, just as a peace offering, they took, they burnt that, but they took the rest of it. And notice he mentioned specifically the the dung as well. They didn't wash it out. They didn't clean it. But you know, as the saying goes, they got the good, the bad, and the ugly. All, all of it was burnt because all of sin has to be dealt with, doesn't it? Right. Even the nastiest of sin has to be dealt with. And that is why this is the first of the required offerings versus the offerings that were voluntary, because sin always has to be dealt with. He says they take they took it out to where the ashes were poured out. You know, for the burnt sacrifices, for the brazen altar, they kept the fire going continually, but they had to take the ashes and they took them outside of the camp and they poured them out, not in necessarily any specific spot that I'm aware of, but they just outside the camp of Israel. And it says here that they were to take this bullock, take it to that same spot, and to burn it. With, burn it on the wood with fire it says so the rest of it was to be burnt up and consumed there was none to be left when it came to the offering of the priest this also is different as we'll see in some of the other sacrifices like I said this taking outside the camp signified removing their sins from them we'll go on to the next offering is for the whole congregation of Israel in verse 13 
And it says in verse 13, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and a thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin, and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. Just as all of Israel could fall into sin, so can all of a church, can't it? Right. If you don't believe that, look at the churches in Asia Minor, or Re Asia Minor in Revelation. Right. No, numerous ones of them, he told to repent, or he would come and remove their candlestick. So yes, the whole congregation of Israel could be in sin, and some, even in sin and ignorance, it says. You know, when the Lord caused us to grow in grace, we could see how that we had something wrong before. We should repent of that, shouldn't we? Yeah, it says, when the sin which they had sinned against it is known, you know, when we're convicted of sin, we should deal with it, shouldn't we? Yeah. When sin is known, we are to deal with it, not just to look over it. But here they were... Just as a priest, they were to bring a young bullock for the sin. They were to bring it before the tabernacle and to slay it there. But the difference here, we see the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock. So elders, kind of as a rep representatives of the people, were to lay their hands upon it, as we've seen previously, which seems almost identical to the elders of the church, doesn't it? That how the pastor is a, if you will, representative on behalf of the church. Not that he has to bear all our sins or anything like that, but that certainly he is has a responsibility to deal with sin when he sees it. And right. Certainly he has a responsibility to see for the welfare of our souls. In fact, I think that's how Peter describes it, that they, they are the shepherds of our souls. Let's look on in the next verse, verse 16 here. He goes on to describe what they should do with the, with the offering. It says, And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to that tabernacle of congregation, of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. So this is the same as we saw in the previous verses. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord. That is, in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So here again, he was to dip his fingers in it, sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, and put some of it upon the horns of the altar of incense, and the rest would pour at the bottom of the brazen altar. And he shall take, verse 19, all of his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. So again, we see all the fat is burned up because that belongs to the Lord. Verse 20 says, And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. And he shall carry forth the bullock without the camp and burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for the congregation. Really very similar to the for the priest here. He was to burn all the fat, and they were to take it without the camp and to burn the rest of it. And it says that it was an atonement, or for, and they shall be forgiven. So atonement means to purge or to cleanse. They were cleansed of their sins, and they were forgiven. Right. You have a comment, Brother Junior? Yeah, uh, on the bullets, do you think that had anything to do with the golden thing that they were molded and all that? On the never really thought about it that way. Some people will say that the bullock was supposed to represent the strength of Christ. But certainly the first sin offering I think was when he, Moses came back down. In fact, uh, yesterday was 
what the Jews call Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, mentioned in Leviticus chapter 16. It's said that that first Day of Atonement, it's 40 days after their New Year, the I forget which New Year, they have two New Years. One's a religious New Year, one's a civil New Year. Supposedly that is when they, that Yom Kippur, which is 40 days later, is when Moses came down the second time and found them worshiping and made it, or came down the second time and made atonement for their sins of worshiping the calf. Uh, brother. Do they still go for their religious New Year? I'm assuming they do 28 day months instead of like we do. Yeah, it's still based on the lunar calendar, but it's. You know, back around Passover is around the is the first of the one year, and then here in the fall of the year is the first of the other year. Okay. Leviticus 16 kind of describes that. That Leviticus 16 is when the yearly sacrifice was set up and the scapegoat. Maybe if we have some time, we can look at that. That's when the Day of Atonement was set up when they fasted for a day and they brought their sin offering and the scapegoat was offered as well. Let's go on to our next uh, offering here, the offering that is for the ruler. Verse 22, it says, When a ruler has sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, his God concerning things which should be or should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin wherein he has sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. So here we see a change for the rulers. But he says, he shall bring a kid of the goats, a young goat, a male without blemish. But again, it has to be without blemish, perfect if you will. Verse 24 says, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord it is a sin offering so the same they should kill it out outside the tabernacle there by the brazen altar and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering so here instead of putting the blood on the horns of the altar of incense it's on the altar of burnt offering or which is the brazen altar. I'm really not sure what the significance is other than perhaps the rulers and the common people, they could not enter into the tabernacle without being cleansed first, unlike the priest. Right. Perhaps that's the significance of it that they, so their atonement for sin was to be made outside before they could even enter into the tabernacle. Because this is the same as for the common people, and it's different for the priest and for the whole congregation. Verse 26 says, And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar, as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. So again, all the fat was to be burned, just as we've seen previously, and as with the peace offering. Because the fat belongs to God. But anyone have noticed what was left out here in this offering? Yeah, they don't. In fact, it doesn't say anything about taking it out and burning the rest of it. No. I think we'll see. I want to address that when we get to the end of the chapter. Uh, chapter six addresses what they are to do with the rest of it. So for the rulers and for <coughs> excuse me, for rulers and for the common people, they weren't to take it outside the camp and to burn the rest of it. So just keep that thought there, and we'll look at it when we get to the end of the chapter here. Let's go ahead and read the offering for the common people, which is very similar, but slight differences. Verse 27 says, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, you know, that's you and I, the common people, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning which ought not to be done, and be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge, he, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin, which he has sinned. See, there's first difference. It had to be a female goat. 
Still a young goat without blemish. As we mentioned last week, I think the female identifies it with us as man. You know, man is described as born of a woman. Man, I'm not sure how to say this without sounding the wrong way, but you know, man came was created of God, but the female was created out of the man. Right. So the female represents the human race, if you will. But does so it be a female without blemish for his sin which he has sinned? Verse 29 says, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. So it's here the same as we've seen before. Verse 30, And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. So the same as the previous one. We'll see another difference here in verse 31 though. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Of all the sin offerings, this is the only one that's it said it was a sweet savor unto the Lord. Perhaps it was because it was for the common people. That's who God chooses most often, isn't it? He doesn't choose the very often the high and mighty, but the base things of the world, he says in First Corinthians. Yes. Yeah, all these in this chapter say they're done through ignorance. Yeah, as Eve didn't know what she was she was deceived, it says, or beguiled. One thing I is pointed out in a lot of commentaries, or some commentaries at least, is that goats often symbolize the judgment of God. Uh, if you remember Matthew chapter 25, uh, it says at the end Christ would separate his sheep on his right hand and the goats to the left hand. And the sheep, he would say, you know, Here's eternal life. I can't remember exactly the words of it. It's in Matthew 25, verses 32 through 41, the whole thing. But then on the goats on the left, and he said, Depart into everlasting punishment, prepared for the devil and his angels. I think the point is that the goat is representing being punished of sin. In Zechariah 10.3, another place God speaks of punishing the goats specifically. And the scapegoat is also used as signifying carrying away sin. And the ram in Abraham's offering, that's a goat, that's a wild goat. Oh, there is a provision for a land to be used. It seems like there, there's always provision for a land to be used, which Christ is described as the Lamb of God. So he fulfills all of them in that. And that's what I want to look at next here. Verse 32 through the end of the chapter. Still we have sins for the common people, but this time if they bring a lamb, it says in verse 32, And if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings and the priest shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed and it shall be forgiven him. Really, This is the same as we saw but this time for a lamb. But in all these things, it says their sins have been atoned for and they shall be forgiven. Just as even if we sin through ignorance, we can go to God for forgiveness. What did First uh, John say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
that's what atoning is, is a cleansing. But as I said, it doesn't mention what to do with the rest of the offering here. And for the common people and for the rulers, we'll find what they were doing with it in chapter 6 of Leviticus. I would like to go over there, look at just a few verses. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 24 through 30. Verse 24 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed. Before the Lord it is most holy. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. See, here's what they were doing with the rest of it. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. They had to eat it in the tabernacle. Whatsoever, verse 27 says, shall thou, or shall touch the flesh thereof, shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereof it was sprinkled in the holy place. But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden, or that means you know, boiled, or it sometimes is used baked or roasted also in the scriptures, but boiled seems to be the indication here, shall be broken. And if he if it be sodden in a brass pot, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. So it had to be you know, roughed up, polished, if you will, cleaned completely off and rinsed in water. And it says, All the males among the priests shall eat it thereof. It is most holy. And no sin offering, notice verse 30, no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place shall be eaten it shall be burnt in the fire so they brought the blood of the offering for the priest and for the whole congregation into the holy place and put the blood there on the altar of incense so those offerings weren't to be eaten it says they were to be burnt with fire but that which wasn't brought into the holy place which was the offering for the rulers and for the common people that was to be eaten by the priest once again, this is their provision. This was how God provided for their needs was by giving them of the offerings of the common people and of the rulers. Right. I can't imagine sodden meat was the greatest tasting. Boiled lamb or boiled bullock, which is usually an ox or a male cow. I think when you boiled it, it probably would boil out any blood that was in there. Because they weren't to eat of any of the blood. For, as we looked at various reasons. But it says even, it says it's a holy thing. So even the pot that was to be broken or to be thoroughly cleaned, they weren't to take it outside of the tabernacle eat it. They were to eat it in the tabernacle. This is important when I want to look at a, a few verses here in a moment. Yes, we have any questions before we move on to the next part of our lesson, uh, particularly about the sin offering? It's. A, I would uh, say this, you know, a lot of people will, will, you know, give you like crazy, you know, examples like you know the little, you know, pygmies in Africa, and but this shows they were uh, accountable. A sin, uh, you know, yeah, a sin of ignorance. They, even. Yes, sins of ignorance have to be dealt with just as much as sins of non-ignorance, if you will. In fact, he goes into more detail about sins of ignorance than any of the rest of the sacrifices. Sin always has to be dealt with, whether we want to admit it or not. Awareness is not an excuse. No, I think he says... Well, not only does is there a law is the law of God written in their hearts, but they're without excuse, the scripture says. Now I don't I'm sure some of those over there might not know all the details that we know, but yet they know in their heart there is a God and they are accountable to him. 
That's why it's our job to t take them the gospel. Because right. as we know, and as we'll see in our study, the blood of Christ is the only thing that can take away sin forever. You know what? If we notice here, and it said when the sin should come to remembrance, he was to bring this offering. Now, I know later on the yearly offering would be instituted. But some, I wonder if at one point they had to bring it each time they realized they sinned. Mm -hmm. I know I sure would go through a whole lot of livestock. But yeah, in ex Exodus, they go through and describe them. Once the tabernacle was built, at least they did. And in fact, that was one of the reasons uh, Mo Moses petitioned Pharaoh. He says, "Let us go in the wilderness that we may offer burnt offerings." They were to he said they were to eat of this offering if it was from the holy or from the common people or from the rulers. Well, well no, it's just a few chapters later they messed that up. Uh, but a few things to take away from this: this was a required offering. As I said sin always had to be dealt with. You know, it wasn't optional. I don't think serving God is ever really optional, but we do it of our own free will, if you will. But sin is not dealt with of our own free will. Sin is required to be dealt with. All the offerings had to be without blemish. Just as we've seen, they always had to be a perfect offering. And then, depending on the sacrifice, it could be male or female. A part was offered outside the camp or to be eaten by the priest, depending on who it was offered for. This is a change from what we've seen previously. All right, um, I would like to go over Leviticus chapter 10. Here are a few other notable scriptures we have about the sin offering. Leviticus chapter 10. Moses addresses Eleazar and Ithamar. I think that's how you say that name. If you're familiar at all with this passage of scripture, their brothers, or two of their brothers, had just died because they offered strange incense. So here, Moses is telling them what was theirs to have in each of the offerings. And we won't read all this. Start, but it starts in verse 12, I believe it is. Yeah. Well, I guess help if I get to the right place here. Leviticus 10, verse 12, he begins, and Moses spake unto Aaron, and to Eleazar, and to Ithamar, his sons, that were left, because the others had died. And he goes on to tell them which part of each offering was theirs. We get down to verse uh, 16, though. It says, And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy? And God hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 18, Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place, as I had commanded. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And such things have befallen me, and if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been acceptable in the sight of the Lord? And when Moses had heard that, he was content. See, they, Moses couldn't find the goat of the sin offering. He was upset. He was angry, it says here, because they were to eat of it. That was the command of God. Because this wasn't, as it says here, the blood was not brought into the holy place. As we saw in our text, if it wasn't brought in the in the holy place, they were to eat of it. If it was brought in the holy place, they were not to eat of it. But they burnt it instead. They took it outside the camp and burnt it. Just a few chapters later, they're already messing up. And they're, uh, they obviously didn't learn too much from their brothers because their brothers had just died for offering strange incense. 
Aaron kind of makes an excuse for him. You know, he says, well, we just offered our sin offering and burnt offerings, and you know we're we're sad about our our family that passed away. Right. And so, you know, it says, if I had eaten of the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? He says, well, would I be acceptable in the sight of the Lord if I had done that? We're never we never go wrong doing the way God tells us to do things. We are really we should always follow God's way whether it goes along with our understanding or not because it says it was a most holy thing a thing that's dedicated to God you know we are not to use it for any other purpose the law had has lots of details and they were to follow it we could probably spend our whole class studying out the law. Uh, there was the Pharisees pretty much dedicate their whole lives to studying the law, the ins and outs of it. Thanks be to God that we live in an age of grace, though, don't we? That all of that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But we still ought not to be just careless with things God has told us to do. Let's turn over to First Samuel chapter two. First Samuel chapter two. Perhaps you're familiar with this context here. Uh, old Hophni and Phinehas were at it. The sons of Eli, as they're addressed in the beginning of the chapter here. First Samuel chapter two, verse number twelve. It says now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Samuel said plainly, they were of the devil. That sons of Belial is used in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see sons of the wicked one, or Christ called the Pharisees, I believe it was, you're of your father the devil. So yes, spiritually speaking, people can be the child of Satan. They knew not the Lord, so they were not, as we would say, saved people. Verse 13 says, and the, Lord, and the priest custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant came, all the flesh was seething, with the flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before the burnt, or also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. See, here's where they started messing up. They didn't want what God had given them. So we don't want that old boiled meat. We want some raw stuff. I don't know if they were planning to fry it up or to add some seasoning to it or what they were going to do with it, but they weren't happy with the provision of God. It says, And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently. Because remember, they were to burn the fat first before the rest was dealt with. And then take as much as thy soul desires. Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. If not, I will take it by force. So, if anyone stood up to him and said, No, that's not the right way to do it, they said, well, We're going to take it anyway. Verse 17 says, Where, uh, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. See, there's, their sin was not looked upon lightly by God. Right. It caused other men, it says, to abhor the offering of the Lord. You know, I don't think if we were, say we were going to go up and before the church and confess the sin, which we are to confess our faults one to another. Right. If every time we did that, Brother Larry slapped us over the head or something, we wouldn't be very willing to go up there. That's basically what the 
Hop Night Infinity has we're doing. Uh, they said, well, you're going to give us this or we're going to take it anyway. It made people uh, poor the offerings of the Lord. They didn't want to go offer their offerings. I mean, they were afraid of the priest. And if they tried to do the right thing, the priest would force them to do the wrong thing anyway. You know, that wasn't a very good priest before them. Right. Well, thanks be to God, our great high priest is without sin. Right. If you uh, kind of know the rest of the chapter here, down towards the end, they were pronounced to be to die. The man of God, it says, came down to Eli and said, basically he said, well, why did I choose you? Your sons are wicked, and they're going to die both in the same day. If you all remember, we talked a little bit about the Ark of God, how it was taken by the Philistines, and in 1 Samuel 7 it was returned, but it only made it to the house of Abinadab. When the Philistines took it, that's when Hophni and Phinehas were killed. And in fact, they were killed. Someone came down and told Eli about the ark being taken. He fell off his stool and broke his neck and he died. And then, uh, I forget which son, I think it was uh, Phinehas, his wife was pregnant. She gave birth to a child and died. And they named the child Ichabod. Ichabod would later go to battle. I found that when I was studying. But Ichabod, meaning the glory of the Lord, had departed. So it was not a uh, not a light thing, if you will, to mess with the offerings of God. Right. Just as it's not a light thing to mess with the perfect offering of God, which is Christ. Right. Yet so many today do that, don't they? Yep. And they just as a Hophni and Phinehas, they weren't satisfied with what God had prescribed. Many today aren't satisfied with the way God has prescribed it. Well, they want to add their works to it. They want to add their baptisms to it. They want to add their church membership or their this or that. And there's so many things man has added or even taken away from them. Right. You know, I, some people don't believe in the sufficiency of Christ. They might not tell you that, but that's what they, in practice, believe. Right. If all those things are, in effect, tampering with the offering of God, and that's not a light sin before God, if you will. That's not a small thing in the sight of God to mess with Christ and His sacrifice. I guess we have any questions before we wrap up. Brother Larry, do you have something? Who's any boys, the ones that was devoured by fire? I'm trying to remember. I, think, I don't think they were. I thought they were slain by the... That's, that's the reason I have. Yeah, I think that was Aaron's sons, yeah. the, those sons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the two that messed with the, uh, the incense, they were slain by fire. Yeah. And apparently Eleazar and the other one, if the Mar, apparently they didn't learn much from it because they messed up the sacrifices right afterwards. Now, apparently theirs wasn't so bad that God pronounced death upon them, but uh, any other comments? Would like to just prescribe one topic of homework. Uh, we will be looking at the trespass offering, and as I mentioned. The sin offering is carried over slightly into the beginning of chapter 5. It kind of merges together. But we are dead in trespasses and sins. They are two different things. But for homework, I'd like you to... There's a trespass offering mentioned in the scriptures, which is different than the trespass offering of chapter 5. It's offered by the non-Jews, well, heathens, in the Old Testament. We've made reference to this incident a couple times in this class already. I'll give you that much. I find this trespass offering that was offered by some non-Jews, but it was different than the trespass offering of chapter 5. It was not a 
offering of animals. If you look, if you search for trespass offering, look it up, you'll come across it, I'm sure. All right, nothing else, we'll close up for the night. All right, we'll see you all next week, Lord willing. Look at Leviticus chapter 5.